If we want machines that have intelligence that is similar to that of animals and humans, that have common sense, um, perhaps at some point have consciousness and everything, um, but like are, are capable of really sort of learning really complex uh, uh, structure of, of complex worlds, we need to we need to crack that uh, that problem. So we we've been working on. Um, let, let me let me give you a very simple um, calculation. Yeah. A um, a typical large language model uh, is trained with something on the order of twenty trillion tokens, right? Or twenty twenty thousand billion tokens. A token is like a word, more more or less. A token typically is represented on uh, three bytes. Okay. So twenty or thirty trillion tokens each on three bytes, that's about 10 to the 14 bytes, a one with 14 zeros behind it. This is the totality of all the text available publicly on the internet. Uh, it would take any of us several hundred thousand years to read through that material. Okay, So it's an enormous amount of information. But then you compare this with the amount of information that gets to our brain through the visual system in the first four years of life, and it's about the same amount. In four years, a young child has been awake a total of about 16,000 hours. Um, the amount of information getting to the brain through the, the, the optic nerve is about uh, 2 megabytes per second. Do the calculation, and that's about 10 to the 14 bytes. It's about the same. In four years, a young child has, has seen as much information or data as the biggest LLMs. And what that tells you is that we're never going to get to human-level AI by just training on text. We're going to have to get systems to understand the, the real world. Um, and that understanding the real world is really hard. Uh, there's a big question, which is at the root of a lot of problems in computer science, in physics, information theory, in a lot of different fields, which is the question of how you quantify information. Okay, How much information resides in a message? And uh, the, the point I've made multiple times is that the amount of information in the message is not uh, an absolute quantity, because it's, it's, it depends on the person interpreting this message. The amount of information you can extract from sensors, from a message language that someone, that someone tells you, or whatever, depends on how you can interpret that. And so the, the idea that you can measure information in absolute term is probably false. You, every measure of information is relative to a particular way of interpreting that information. So that's kind of the, the point I was making. And this has very far-ranging consequences, because if there is no absolute way of measuring information, that means there's a lot of notions in physics that don't really have you know, kind of objective definitions, like entropy. So entropy is a measure of our ignorance of the state of a physical system. And of course, that depends on how much you know about the system. Um, and so um, I've, I've been sort of uh, obsessed with this idea of trying to find co good ways of defining uh, entropy, complexity, or information uh, content that is, is relative. Don't you think that our global database to train AI models is over? We digitalized 100% of our data in 2000 that was 25% uh, data digitalized today all. So we're not even close, no. There's, there's a huge amount of uh, textual knowledge that is not, has not been digitized. Um, and you know maybe in a, a lot of the developed world, a lot of it has been digitized, but uh, most of it is not public. There's a lot of medical data, for example, that is not public. And then there is a lot of cultural data uh, historical data in a lot of regions in the world that is not accessible in digital form. Or if, it's in, if it is in digital form, it's in the form of scanned documents, so it's not you know, text or anything. So, I, it, so it's not true. I think there's still a lot of data out there. Well, so I, think, I don't think we should be obsessed by the question of uh, consciousness. I, I think it's a, the world is obsessed, I think. The world is, I mean, some parts of the world are obsessed by it. Uh, frankly, I think it's a bit of an epiphenomenon, and I think it's probably the reason why we can't find a good definition of consciousness is because we're not asking the right question. Let me, let me give you an example. In the 18th century, people discovered, or the 17th century, they, they discovered that the image 
on the retina, iris, iris. you know, the you know light comes through the yeah. iris, and you have a lens, and the image on the retina forms upside down. And so the people at a time were completely puzzled: how is it that we see the world right side up, even though the image is formed upside down in a retina? That was a puzzle for them. And now we realize that question makes no sense. I mean, it's just that you know the the way you think about. Uh, you know how you, how your your brain interprets images. It's irrelevant. You know in what direction the image forms on your on your retina. So so I think consciousness is a bit like this. It's something that you know we we can't define. We think exists, but we can't put our finger on it. And, and would make us individuals. So maybe. Oh, that's, that's different. What... That's different. No, no, obviously, I mean, there's a lot of things that you know make us all different from each other. We have a different experience. Um, so we we learn different things, right? Uh, we, we, we grew up in different environments, uh, but also our brains are wired slightly differently. All of us are slightly different. And that's a necessity for evolution to uh, make sure that every individual human is different because we are, you know, we are a social animal. So there is a big advantage um, when different people in the same tribe are slightly different because that means they can combine their expertise. If, if every one of us was identical, then there would not be strength in number. Okay? But because we're different, we're stronger because we're diverse. So, um, so that's a result of uh, evolution. And that can be done by you know, different, slightly different wiring of the brain, slightly different tuning of the you know, different neurotransmitters and hormones and whatever uh, that makes us different. The question of elaborating abstract representations from observation is key to deep learning. Deep learning is all about learning representations. In fact, one of the main conferences on, on deep learning is called International Conference on Learning Representations, uh, which I created, I co-created with Yosha Benjo. So this, this tells you how central this question of learning abstract representations is to, uh, to AI generally and uh, to deep learning in particular. Um, now, if you want a system to be able to reason, um, you, you need another set of characteristics. You, basically, the, the act of, of reasoning or planning, uh, classically in AI, not just in machine learning based AI, but, but since the 1950s, consists in uh, having a way of searching for a solution to a problem. OK, so for example, if I give you a list of cities and I ask you, give me the shortest circuit that goes through all those cities. Okay. You, you're going to think about it and say, well, I'm, you know, I should go from cities that are nearby so that my total circuit is as close as possible. Now, there is a space of all possible circuits, which is a set of all permutations of the cities, right, in all the orders in which you can go through the cities. It's an enormous uh, space. And the way algorithms that, you know, in your GPS and things like this search for a pass is that they, they search through among all possible paths for one that is the shortest. All reasoning uh, uh, systems are based on this idea of a search. Okay, for in a space of possible solution, you search for one that matches what uh, you know the objective that you want. Um, so the way current systems uh, are, are doing this, uh, current LLMs like O1, like you know R1, you know, a bunch of, other, of those things are doing it is in a very, very primitive way. They're doing this in, in what's called token space, which is a space of outputs. So they basically have the system generate lots of different sequences of tokens, um, more or less randomly. And then they have another neural net looking through all of those um, hypothesized sequences for one that looks the best. And then it outputs that. It's extremely expensive because it requires generating lots and lots of outputs and then selecting uh, good ones. And it's not the way we think. So we don't think by you know, generating lots and lots and lots of actions and then looking at the result and then figuring out which one is best. That's not the way we think. If I, if I ask you, for example, imagine a cube floating in the air just in front of you. Okay. Now take that cube and rotate it by 90 degrees around a vertical axis. OK, so you have a cube rotated by 90 degrees. Now picture that cube. And tell me if it looks like the original cube. 
before you rotate it. Okay? And the answer is yes, because you know that a cube has, you know, is if you rotate it by 90 degrees, it's still a cube, it's, and you're still seeing it from the from the same uh, the same viewpoint. You mean that is illusion of free reasoning? Well, so what you're doing is that you're reasoning in your mental state, you're not reasoning in your output action state, action space. In the physical world. In the physical world. Or in whatever your your output state is, right? You're you're reasoning in a, in an abstract space. And so we have those mental models of the world that allow us to kind of predict what's going to happen in the world, manipulate uh, reality, predict in advance what the consequences of our actions are going to be. And if we can predict what the consequences of our actions are going to be, like rotating a cube at 90 degrees or whatever it is, then we can plan a sequence of actions so as to arrive at a particular goal. Right? So, um, you know, whenever we accomplish a task consciously, um, you know, all of our mind is focused on it. And we think about like what sequence of action do I have to do to you know assemble this piece of you know IKEA furniture or whatever, or or build this uh, thing out of wood, or uh, or just you know do anything. Basically, everything we do every day that we use our our mind for um, our task of this type, where we need to plan. And most of the time, we plan we plan uh, hierarchically. So we don't. For example, you're gonna. Go, go back to Waza at some point, right? Um, if you decide right now to go back to Waza from New York, mm -hmm. um, you know that you have to go to the airport and catch a plane. Okay, now you have a sub goal going to the airport. And this is what hierarchical planning is about. You, you define sub goals to an uh, ultimate goal. Your ultimate goal is to go to Waza. Your sub goal is go to the airport. How do you go to the airport? Well, we're in New York, so you go down on the street and you hail a taxi to the airport. How do you go down on the street? Well, you have to move out of this building, go to the elevator, take the elevator down, move out. How do you go to the elevator? You have to stand up, go to the door, open the door, etc. And at some point, you get down to a goal that is sufficiently close that you don't need to plan, like to, to stand up. You know, from your chair, you don't need to plan because you're so used to doing it, you, you can just do it, right? Uh, and you have all the information that's necessary for that. So this idea that we're going to need to do hierarchical planning, that intelligence systems need to do hierarchical planning, is crucial. We have no idea how to do this with machines today. That's a big challenge for the next few years.